My name is Erwin Zalkin, I-R-W-I-N-Z-A-L-K-I-N. I'm with the Zalkin Law Firm. We are out of San Diego and New York. Our firm has represented survivors of childhood sexual abuse over the last 20 years. We've represented hundreds of survivors. To my right is Ross Leanodakis. Ross is an attorney with the law firm Nix Patterson. The spelling of the last name is L-E-O-N-O-U-D as in David, A-K-I-S. That firm is uh, notorious right now. They just got a $38 million judgment in a case out of Montana involving uh, sexual abuse of a Jehovah's Witness child. We've called this press conference today to announce that we filed yet another lawsuit against the Jehovah's Witnesses, and in particular, against the governing body of the Jehovah's Witnesses. These eight gentlemen that run the entire world organization of Jehovah's Witnesses, make the policies for the Jehovah's Witnesses, dictate all of the practices of the Jehovah's Witnesses and their elders, their congregation elders, their elders uh, their construct is a little bit different than other Christian denominations. They have kingdom halls, not churches. They have a body of elders that operate similar to a priest. They have ministerial servants that operate similar to what a deacon might be. And all of the instructions and operations come from the very top. So we're suing the organization, uh, various levels of the organization, as well as the top eight guys called the governing body. Now for years we have been pursuing litigation against Jehovah's Witnesses because they have a pervasive and a severe problem of child sexual abuse within that organization that they've been covering up for decades. Early on we discovered that they maintain a database of known child molesters within the organization that dates back decades. We have received court orders for them to produce those documents, those molestation files, which they have refused to do. These, uh, this has gone all the way up to the California Supreme Court and back, and they still refuse to obey court orders to produce these documents in a form that they can be used and be understood so we can see the level of knowledge that this institution has had about abusers within their organization and the cover-up that's been going on for decades of known molesters. I want to give you just a little example. In Australia, the government there just conducted an, uh, an investigation and released a report in 2017 that showed that they had discovered among a, a population of 67,000 Jehovah's Witnesses that there were 1,800 children molested and 1,000 molesters. Now extrapolate that to the United States where there's a, about a million and a half Jehovah's Witnesses and some 14,000 congregations. You can do the math yourself to get an idea of the scale of this problem. And they do have what I refer to as a crisis of silence in the organization. They're extremely secretive. They keep themselves insulated from the outside world. They view the outside world as being impacted by Satan, not to be trusted. That the institutions of the outside world are governed by Caesar's law. And that if they have any issues, any problems, they need to go to their elders. And everything is kept within the organization. And that is the big problem. And that's why uh, children are getting molested and these are going unreported, these molestations, despite the fact that in most states they are mandated reporters under the law as clergy, they don't report. Now they'll tell you, oh, we don't discourage people from reporting. We even encourage people to report. <coughs> but the reality is, the reality is that people won't report because they're indoctrinated that they are not to bring reproach against Jehovah. They don't go to the outside authorities because they're taught not to trust outside authorities. Who would you go, why would you go to law enforcement when you can go to the righteous elders and they will 
take care of the problem. The problem is they don't do that. In the case before you, we have our client, Kevin Ramirez, who is a very brave young man who's come forward publicly using his name, using his name. He's not a doe. He's not hiding behind a doe designation. He's here with the courage to use his own name and to go public with this lawsuit because he wants the world to understand what has happened to him and what is happening to other children within the Jehovah's Witnesses. Kevin was born in 1993. By the time he was six years old in 1999, he came under the wing of a elder in the San Dimas Spanish congregation of the Jehovah's Witnesses here in LA County, a man by the name of Humberto Ramirez, not related, who became his mentor, became his Bible study teacher. The children are taught that they are to obey and trust the elders above all, which he did. And soon after that relationship developed, Humberto started to groom Kevin into performing sexual acts with Humberto. And that grooming involved telling, Humberto, uh, telling Kevin that, you know, Kevin, these are the things you have to do because this is what will get you into a paradise ever after. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe in an end of days, and if you live in their world and what they call the truth, and uh, you remain clean within the truth, you will live in a paradise on earth ever after. And a six-year-old child whose family is indoctrinated in that belief will trust that if he doesn't obey, then that's not going to happen, and that's what happened to Kevin. He was abused for a period of six years, I'm sorry, from the ages of six to eight. In 2001, when he was eight years old, he told his parents, he reported this, and other kids, what happened was they started having a conversation with other kids that he knew Humberto was hanging around with, and then they started talking and they started comparing what was happening to each other, and then he told his parents, they went to the elders. The elders conducted their, what they call a judicial committee, a tribunal. And they disfellowshipped Humberto, which is a, sort of the equivalent of an excommunication, but he can re be reinstated if he, if he applies later. But they didn't go to the police. No one told the police. And as a result, this young man has never really received the justice he deserves. He suffered a lot in his life, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about what he's gone through as a result of this, of the sexual abuse that he experienced. And uh, the purpose of this lawsuit really is to get him the justice he deserves through the civil justice system. That, that's all that we have left now, and we're going to do the best to get that for him. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to add it. It takes a lot of courage to do uh, what Kevin's doing here today, and, and Kevin will tell you he hopes um, that by speaking up and bringing this to the public's attention, he not only will bring recognition to what's happening within the Jehovah's Witnesses, but encourage others to speak up because it is, uh, it's not easy. Um, as Erwin mentioned, our firm, Mitch Patterson, has represented victims of sexual abuse uh, involved with Jehovah's Witnesses, and uh, we are excited to team up with uh, Irwin and Zalkin, Zalkin firm, they've been doing this for a long time. They're one of the best there is at it. So um, we're honored to represent Kevin um, and to, to team up with the Zalkin firm and hope to bring this issue to the public's light and, and continue to represent victims um, across the country. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to trick change? I think you would be free to sit there. Yeah, that's better.
moving forward as close as you can to the mic. Good, yes. Thanks. Well, my name is Kevin Ramirez, and I was born into the religion of the Jehovah's Witness. You know, growing up, you are, you are indoctrinated and you are taught to trust these elders with everything. Like you said, they are your mentors. They are, there, they are the equivalent to what a priest would be in the churches. So everything started with Bible study. I don't know how other people start, but my case started with Bible study, and he got the trust of my family, he got the trust of other families to go out. So as time went on, it went from Bible studies to service. They call it preaching when they go door to door. And that's when the molestation happened. You know, and thinking back now, when I say all of the things that happened, I think that he was grooming me, he was prepping me for other things that, you know, as a kid you would have never thought, thought of, but looking back now, it's some really dark stuff. The way this has affected me now, it's practically every time I drive by a kingdom hall, I feel disgust because you never know what's going behind closed doors. You never know if other kids are going through the same thing. I suffer from like, you know, anger problems. Like, I just start thinking about stuff that happens. And can you describe any of the things you did or dark thoughts? He would fondle, he would touch, and vice versa, he would make, make us touch him. He would tell us that these are the things that we need to do, or if, if we don't do them, we, wouldn't, we won't make it to what they call paradise. So, you know, being indoctrinated as a kid, you think that paradise is real, you think this is gonna happen. So I didn't tell anybody, I didn't tell anybody from school, I didn't tell my, my family, because my family weren't Jehovah's Witnesses, so. I didn't really talk to them about things. Ken, what, oh, sorry. Was there a particular... So that's when I decided to go tell my parents when, you know, like my other friends, like we talked amongst ourselves and we decided that this was something that adults needed to know what was happening. Sir, uh, over here on the left, I, I didn't quite get your name. My name is Kevin Ramirez. No, yeah. Uh, no, it, it, Ross Leonidakis. Can you spell that last name? L-E-O-N-O-U-D-A-K-I-S. And in resolving the Montana case, did that go through the entire legal process or did you settle at some point? No, we had a, a verdict reach last fall and we we're actually arguing that to the Montana Supreme Court next month. So it's on appeal right now. And uh, aside from justice in this particular case, uh, is there any monetary um, figure that you're looking to, to gain from this? Is there anything else? We're, the main reason for bringing these lawsuits, the first and foremost reason is to bring attention to what is going on within the Jehovah's Witnesses. At some point, will there be monetary compensation? Well, this is a civil case, not a criminal case, and the only kind of recourse we have is some sort of financial accountability. So it, at some point, yes, we, we are going to do our best to get Kevin a, a fair uh, financial resolution uh, to help him through the rest of his life because these, it, the, the harm that is done to children by sexual abuse is lifelong and it's insidious and it appears and rears its head, ugly head at different times in a, in a human's life and causes havoc. So uh, he's gonna need help for the rest of his life and we're gonna do our best to get him there. Kevin, you mentioned your friends you spoke with, I assume you're talking about other victims. Are you hoping to encourage others to speak out? Do you know others who you're hoping will speak up? You know, I would encourage anybody who has similar stories to speak up. My two friends will then friends who I tried communicating with them through Facebook, I couldn't find the other one, and the other one didn't want to take part of this because he's still in the religion. So I'm assuming he's, he's indoctrinated to the point where he's scared to do anything outside of the religion. When did you leave the, your religion? Oh, as soon as I turned 18. So your family was I'm, also still part of it, or are they still part of it? No, not anymore. Nobody's part of it. They, have, they call it they call it PIMO, which is physically in, mentally out. So 
so that's what I was practically my whole life. Like I know I, I read through the lies. I knew it was all it was all a facade. It was all fake to me. I never really believed in anything. So you even during after you made a claim to your and your family made a yeah. claim to yeah, you they, still did Bible study and came not with him. I didn't. I didn't really do Bible study with anybody else after that. So, talking, if there's one key to winning a case like this, what would you say that it is? The truth, exposing the truth. Once people hear the truth, that's it's it's a natural consequence. They, they've thrown many, they, they continue to throw barrier after barrier right. in front of you, and, and from those barriers, including claiming they have the right to not speak to the law or to, to law enforcement, uh, among those issues, what's the main one to overcome? Well, the, the right now, our, our main battle with them is to get the, these molestation records that they have, these, this database of records that they have that go back decades. I, I have some of them. They've produced them to us under a court protective order. I can't talk about the contents of that, what I've seen. Uh, but they've redacted the information in those records so heavily that it makes those records names of perpetrators, names of elders, names of congregations. We can't tell if this elder has been in uh, more than one congregation. Uh, it, 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 the courts have ordered them to remove these redactions, and they refuse to do that. So uh, this this has to get resolved, and we are going to continue to battle to get these documents. and uh, And I think those documents will expose a tremendous and a very unfortunate truth. You said um, that Umberto was excommunicated. Essentially, what is he still outside? There's a, there's, they, they refer to um, a process or a discipline that they call disfellowshipping. And disfellowshipping is somewhat akin to excommunication. Uh, the person is basically shunned by Jehovah's Witnesses, by their congregation, by their family. Uh, they are, uh, still can attend, they can still come to the kingdom halls, they can sit at meetings, but they're not going to be um, recognized. They can then apply to be reinstated, and if they, uh, according to the elders to whom they apply, have demonstrated enough remorse, then they can be reinstated. And uh, the one thing about the process, the judicial process, these what they call judicial committees, the discipline that they engage in, if they learn of child sexual abuse, even if it's validated, and they have something they call the two witness rule. And that's how they determine if there's a valid claim. The two witness rule means this. Either they must have a confession from the perpetrator or there must be two witnesses to the abuse. If they don't have a confession or they don't have two witnesses, they can do nothing. Now even if they do get a confession or they do get two witnesses, the recourse is to determine if the perpetrator is repentant enough. If he is sufficiently repentant, he will get what is called a private reproof, which means that they will speak with him privately. Some congregation privileges might be removed, but there will be no more discussion about it to the congregation. If there, he's somewhat repentant but not repentant enough, he may get what's called a public reproof. So they will make an announcement to the congregation that this individual has been reproved, but they will not say why, and they will take away some privileges. If they feel he's not repentant at all, uh, then they can disfellowship him or disfellowship or will disfellowship him. But even then, they don't tell the congregation why. So people don't know that there's a potential that a child molester is living and attending meetings and going out on service work, knocking on people's doors in our communities, don't know that this person could be a child molester. And Karen, that's the problem. With regard to your faith, how do you, how do you, what do you consider yourself now with regard to uh, the Jehovah's Witness? Are you still part of their... Oh, no. 
No, I'm atheist. I don't believe in anything. Which is really part of the problem that happens to children that are abused, especially in religious organization. One of the traumas that children experience is institutional betrayal. Because this is their religion, this is their spirituality, and they've been betrayed by something they've been taught is sacrosanct. And that has a tremendous impact on people and children throughout their lives. So Kevin, if the, your friends were victimized, are they facing the same age as you? Yeah, they're on the same age group as me. I think one of them is younger than me by a year or two. The other one is definitely my age. Can you talk a little bit about the impact it's had on your life? I tend to block it out, kind of like forget about it, try not to think about it. But every time I drive by Kingdom Hall, like, you know, memories come back. And I get angry in that moment, but then like as I forget about it, it seems to like calm down. When you see other children though that are still going to the Kingdom Halls, Oh, I feel, I feel bad for them. You know, they're growing up in this cult-like religion. You know, by definition, it's not a cult of it, but by behavior, it's a cult. So I kind of want to, like, I mean, I know there's nothing I can do, but I really wish that they could escape. So there's this thing, brevemente en español, que es Sí, la forma que empezó es que él era un anciano que es, él tiene autoridad en la congregación y él me daba estudio de la Biblia y después del de estudio de la Biblia se, se movió a, a predicando por los que van de casa en casa. Y se, para mí se me hizo normal que él y yo fuéramos solos porque yo veía que gente salía predicando en parejas, pero ahí es cuando empezó los actos de molestación. ¿Qué tipo de actos por eso? Tocando y vice versa, para atrás. ¿Durante cuánto tiempo pasó esto y cómo te hizo sentir? ¿Cómo lo hiciste? Pasó entre, o sea, cuando yo tenía seis y terminó cuando tenía ocho. Terminó cuando yo le dije a mi papá si ellos fueron a hablar con la congregación. Lo que estaba pasando en mi mente es, yo pensé que era normal porque él decía que si, que si no pasaba esto no iba a ir al paraíso y desde niño te enseñaban que la meta la última meta es ir al paraíso. ¿Qué fue lo que hiciste? ¿Cómo te armaste de valor? ¿En qué tiempo? ¿Y cómo te sientes ahora? ¿Cómo sientes por otros que compañeros tuyos que también fueron abusados? Pues, ahorita me siento decepcionado con la gente que no ha llamado a los policías, pero a, los, a las víctimas les quiero dar encomio para que salgan um, a platicar, a que salgan, que agarren justicia. ¿Cómo te hace sentir esta congregación? Pues no, no he visto esta congregación en mucho tiempo y no quiero volver a esta congregación. ¿Te ha, te ha dañado hasta el momento en tu vida personal, en matrimonial? Matrimonial casi no, pero más tristeza, un poco de, de coraje cuando los veo. Me, me da coraje porque ¿Cómo puede pasar esto y que gente, por ejemplo, gente, gente que no tiene nada que ver con ello, pero no dicen, no llaman a policía, son igual de culpables por no hablar a la autoridad? Kevin, oh, oh, very quickly, what are your goals in life? What do you want to do? No, just go to school, continue my education, provide for my family. Do you have a career in mind? Probably electrician or HVAC between those two. You don't live in the area that I'm where you said the thing about Indonesia that you don't, you don't like that, go by the, the same thing. Yeah, no, I said the same thing. Do you remember where the edifice was? Yes. 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 Uh, un poquito más de información, con todo gusto eh, compartiré unas palabras con ustedes, en nombre de la firma de abogados
Okay, we're finished. Everybody? I'm 26. 26. 26. And how old are you? I was in third grade. That's a good question. Have I finished? Should I finish? Yeah.